I have assumed up to now that the ultimate objective is uh, to protect consumers. I could have assumed that it is to protect uh, harm to others more generally, not just consumers, and therefore use as a criterion total welfare. Question, is this right? Do competition authorities use this as a standard? Do you use, since you are here, this as a standard? What I know is that in Europe, very, very often, authorities don't use as a standard, and the Competition Commission doesn't use as a standard. The Greek Hellenic Authority, especially since the economists left and there are no commissioners in the authority, they do not use that uh, as a standard. Uh, the, what do they use as a standard? Well, this, this can then vary. So a very good example uh, of what it can be used as a standard actually is provided by the Intel case, in, uh, that, that, the, the very famous now Intel case of the European Commission. And these are, I, I recommend you to look at this article. Uh, Wills is a very well-known legal expert in, uh, who has worked in, for the Commission and, um, in very, from various other positions that takes the, 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 makes the argument that the Intel decision was excellent. And Ray, Advenit, Ray is perhaps the top competition economist in the world right now. He's at the University of Toulouse, Patrick Ray. Advenit is a legal expert, so they wrote an article trying to show that the Intel decision by the commission was very bad. And partly it is very bad because they did not really use a facts-based approach. Even though they say that they did, they didn't use a facts-based. But also they said that it is very bad because they say that the, the court, the commission implicitly, it didn't quite say it, at the court mainly, they did not use the right substantive standard. So what was the substantive standard? Well, as I said, the commission didn't quite want to say it, but the court was not afraid of saying it. It said it very explicitly, and everybody has been very scared since then, which is that uh, it is enough it is enough for you to find violation that the conduct creates a disadvantage on your arrival. So if you do something and this creates a disadvantage on your arrival, and you happen to be dominant, you happen to have a lot of market power, then the European court tells us that this would be enough for violation. But of course, many, many, many things which are completely innocent and have absolutely no negative effect on welfare Will, may have negative effect on your arrivals. So, look, if we are going to use a standard like this, then we use per se rule. You don't need to, to, to then, you don't need to do economics. Why spend all the time and have, spend resources on economists trying to model all this situation? Since uh, it is quite obvious, and uh, by looking at the nature of the contact uh, and uh, with very rudimentary evidence about the market, you can show that there is a negative effect on arrival, full stop, violation. So you see, if you use a substantive standard that is, all, this is not welfareist standard, something like this, uh, damage competitors, then of course your legal standard is constrained a lot, and you are likely to be very close to per se legal standards, and uh, rightly so, and you don't need to use effects based in this case. And here is the last, uh, the most recently developed argument about the role of, of economics in, uh, in, uh, in uh, competition by enforcement. This is that uh, uh, author competition authorities are usually uh, uh, public bodies with various degrees of independence, and uh, they do have, uh, they will typically have a degree of freedom to choose among different courses of action. And all such bodies uh, do care, not just about the welfare implications of their choices on, on the society at large, but they also care a lot about their public image and reputation, which is rightly so, and we expect that this to happen, and we expect that this is, uh, th this is part of uh, uh, economists' uh, arguments about rational decision making in organizations like this. But what are the implications of the fact that competition authorities may care about their reputation and their public image? Then um, 
this depends very much on what performance criteria are given to them. So what are the performance criteria that the principal, which is the government or a government department, <coughs> gives to the competition authority? It says to the competition authority, I'm going to judge your performance in relation to what? If you go to Britain, uh, CMA, which is the current authority, they say to them, I'm going to judge your performance uh, by uh, looking at what benefits you have created every year and uh, to society. And I'm going to, and I want you to measure the benefits that you created to society, and I want to find a ratio of 10 to 1. It used to be 5 to 1. They have now made it two years ago 10 to 1. So I want to, me, you to show me that the benefits to consumers are ten, ten times higher than I spend on you. I spend all this money of you, you have all this big budget, you employ 800 people, so I want to show that this year I spent this money and the benefits you created through your decision to society is ten times higher. So Britain is, uh, has this uh, rule which, okay, fine, then this, what I'm going to, to, to say to you now is not very relevant if they take it seriously. But in most other authorities in the world, by far, performance criteria are not like this. They are much simpler. They relate to the decisions that are made and the productivity in relation to these decisions, how, many, how much staff is used in relation to these, to these decisions. So competition authorities want to run to make a lot of decisions. And uh, also it relates to how many of these decisions were are made and passed successfully through the appeals tribunals. Now, I understand because I made some, I had some questions that in India, the appeals uh, courts are, have not been very active in relation, un until now, in relation to competition uh, uh, law decisions. But in other countries, of course, this is an extremely active system. The, all major decisions in Europe are appealed in uh, the higher courts. Similarly, in the United States, in all member states and in other uh, countries. So, if a competition authority takes a decision and expects that if this decision is going to be reversed by an appeal court, it's not going to like it at all, because this is very bad for its image. So clearly, and this is what this new theory, in which again I have been involved a bit, uh, says, is that a, an authority will use legal standards that minimize the risk of its decision decisions being reversed by courts of appeal. And uh, then uh, we, we have created a very nice uh, model, I think it's nice <laughs> anyway, which shows that uh, if you start using a lot of economic analysis, then because this increases the disputability of your decisions, you are likely to be facing more reversals in courts of appeal. And therefore, you are likely to tend to use standards that have less economic analysis. So a welfare maximizing authority will use much more economics than a reputation maximizing authority when the criteria of performance are what I just mentioned before. Okay? So this is the theory. There is the model that shows that well, everything is clear. We needed to find evidence. Now, it just happens that uh, we want very much to, to look at the evidence comparing America and the EU. But for the moment, the evidence we have comes from an amazing uh, competition authority in terms of its size and decision, which is that of Russia. So Russia was created not many years ago, also the competition authority, but for some reason, the state decided to give it a lot of responsibilities. And they are making thousands and thousands of decisions. They have three and a half thousand people working for them throughout Russia. Three and a half thousand people. It's amazing. It's the biggest by far authority in the world. And between 2008 and 2012, they uh, reached about three and a half thousand decisions because performance criteria <laughs> said that you have to create a lot of decisions, many of which had nothing to do with other trust. Uh, these uh, decisions. Uh, they were just uh, very small regulatory issues. About actually, we found out as we started investigating this with a team from the Higher School of Economics in Moscow that about 88% of the decisions 
of the Russian antitrust authority between 2008 and 2012 have nothing to do with antitrust. They're just small regulatory issues, and only 12%. But 12% is a big number still, very big number. So we tried to look at uh, the appeals that we are making. A lot of appeals, about 60% of the, of the decisions were appealed in higher courts. And uh, we collected, we had a big database, very big database, in order to look uh, at uh, what are the decisions that are mostly reversed by the courts of appeal. And we did find that uh, there was very strong evidence, statistically, very strong statistical evidence, that uh, when the authority tried to increase the amount of analysis that, that uh, require more evidence in order to make a decision, that is, when it moved towards an effects-based standard, the likelihood that the decision would be reversed in the appeal court increased considerably. And as I said, the result has been statistically significant. So that seems to confirm the model which says that uh, if you have the wrong performance criteria, then you may not be using uh, uh, economics because you fear that uh, you are going to be, uh, you are going to be, your decisions are going to be reversed. But of course, this is an interesting new theory and uh, it needs to be investigated empirically much more. And we are sort of collaborating now with other people from Amsterdam and other countries to do it in Europe. And we'll see what we find from this. Uh, so this is the last thing I wanted to mention. Thank you very much again. Sorry for taking more time than I should have done. I hope that, uh, however, you found this of uh, some interest. And uh, again, I'm really honored to be here. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Okay, so uh, in relation to the first question, uh, the, we uh, constructed indicators, we call indicators of the extent of economic evidence. And we have also constructed indicators of the extent to which effects based analysis is used. Uh, you need, this may be uh, somewhat uh, different. So to construct the indicators of the extent of economic analysis, we take uh, a very large number of, uh, of uh, factors into account, starting to, uh, from sort of uh, issues relating to using basic economic analysis like uh, defining the market, establishing market share, uh, to uh, using a theory of harm in uh, some cases, uh, or taking and uh, looking at efficiencies in other cases, undertaking econometric statistical econometric analysis, etc., etc. So we have over 20 different uh, factors that uh, we consider, and then we have a weighting system which uh, we use in order to create the indicator. And uh, uh, when I'm talking about economic analysis, I mean uh, the variation in this indicator and how the variation in this indicator impacts on uh, the probability of uh, reversals. Uh, so, uh, so I, I think I, I may probably, so we, we have these indicators. We also have uh, information about an, uh, and many other uh, characteristics relating both to the decision and to the environment in which the decision was taken in relation to the market, etc., etc., which we could use as control. And we also have, I mean, the database is really uh, something. Uh, we also have a lot of information about uh, the, the, the court system in, in, in the sense that we know who the judges were, how much experience they have, how, in how many cases that they dealt with. 
So we control for all these things in order to look at the impact of the indicator on uh, the probability of reversion. And actually, there are quite other interesting results relating to the experience of judges and how it impacts on this. Uh, you, you have another question. Um, you say that the CMA has this performance criteria of consumer benefit. So how? Uh, CMA. Is, CMA, yes. So how is it actually measured? Consumer benefit, how do they measure it? Well, uh, yeah, I have been in discussions with them about this. They, they for example, uh, they, they, the easiest case to answer is uh, they to, to think of uh, cases of involving uh, collusive behavior or cartels. So they, uh, they, they, they estimate the damages, but uh, they have to estimate the damages if there are claims in any case. So that's the easiest thing for them to put into their uh, performance assessment as well. So once they estimate the damages, uh, you know essentially what you save by finding that there was a cartel there. So what you save goes into that 10, OK? Um, in, 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 in the cases of mergers, it's also uh, relatively easy because it, it means, however, that they need to, to undertake some analysis, like simulation, simulation analysis, which will give them some presumption about the increase in price that will result from the, from the merger net of any efficiencies. So again, the increase in price will allow them to say to what extent consumers will be damaged. And again, this goes into the so this essentially we are trying to, to measure the yes. The, before and after it, they're, they're looking essentially at the price. Sometimes they try to take other things into account. Like if you have a merger which leads to a lot of closures, then you have to take into account, you, you have more sophisticated econom econometric modeling, which will take into account if you close a lot of supermarkets in a specific area, how this is going to impact on the welfare of consumers, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not easy, but certainly it can be uh, done.